Welcome to the Walker House, our little slice of heaven on the Pacific Ocean. My name is Chuck Henderson, and I'm a fourth generation owner of the Cabin on the Rocks. Today, I'm going to relate what I call the origin story. We will talk about how the property came to the family, how Frank Lloyd Wright was engaged, the other houses Wright designed in the Carmel area, design and construction, and a bit about how Della lived in the house. A lot to get to, so let's get started. This is Della Walker, later Van Lobenzels, my great-grandmother. She was married to Clinton Walker, who passed in 1944. Her older sister, Alma, married Clinton's older brother, Willis. Della and Clinton lived in Piedmont, California, on the east side of San Francisco Bay. The two families had been coming down to the Monterey Peninsula since the early 1910s. Alma and Willis bought a house on Pebble Beach, which Della, Clinton, and their family often visited. Sometime in the 1940s, possibly after Clinton's passing, Della started renting a small Welsh cottage on Carmel Beach. She tried to buy the house, unsuccessfully. Alma and Willis were very active in the area. In 1924, they purchased two lots on Carmel Point, along with what was known as Abalone Point, B18 on this map. In 1926, they went further and purchased the 216-acre Martin Ranch. They end up creating Mission Ranch as a recreational club. Mission Ranch is now a hotel and restaurant owned by Clint Eastwood. As Del Della could not buy the Welsh cottage, she acquired Abalone Point from her sister. The transaction came with a requirement that she hire a well-known architect to design the house. Seeking advice, Della consulted her daughter, Harriet, my grandmother. Harriet told her that she should hire Frank Lloyd Wright, saying of Falling Water, built 10 years earlier, if he could do that for a stream, imagine what he can do with an ocean. That hooked Della and led to the client letter. Dear Sir, I own a rocky point of land in Carmel, California, extending into the Pacific Ocean. The surface is flat. It is located at the end of a white sand beach. I am a woman living alone. I wish protection from the wind and privacy from the road and a house as enduring as the rocks, but as transparent and charming as the waves and as delicate as the seashore. You are the only man who can do this. Will you help me? Most sincerely, Della Brooks Walker. Two weeks later, he replies, Dear Mrs. Walker, we are building two houses at Carmel and a third might be convenient. Apparently, you do have a picturesque site. We are enclosing the regular basis for such short service. Sincerely yours, Frank Lloyd Wright. So what were these other two houses? The first one is the Nesbitt House, called Sea Garden. John Nesbitt was a radio and television host in the 30s and 40s. He has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In 1940, Nesbitt bought the Ennis House and asked Frank Lloyd Wright to help him adding a North Terrace pool and ground lever billiard room, as well as the first heating system for the building. His lot was on the coast, north of Carmel, in the Par Carmel Pebble Beach area, along the 17-mile drive. The plan for the property was extensive, with a large house facing the ocean and a covered promenade around the perimeter. This is a perspective of it from the land side and from the ocean side. The other house was the Haldorn House, called The Wave, and was located south of Walker House on the Carmel Point. To the north side of the Walker House, along Carmel Beach, is the Clark House, which was engaged after the Walker House, and which we'll discuss shortly. The slide on the left shows the proposed location of the Haldorn House. Note the public road around the west and south ends of the property. Stuart Haldorn was a lawyer and heir to a large fortune. He and his wife were socialites in San Francisco and had a house in Monterey. Stuart commissioned a painting of his wife, Enid, by Salvador Dali. The painting looks like it is on the beach with Point Lobos in the background. Frank Lloyd Wright did a couple of perspective drawings. Note the tunnel on the left under the road facing the ocean. Now, that would have been quite a dramatic feature. He proposed step-out windows with drop-down vents. Apparently, these windows were first proposed for the House on the Mesa project 
1931, and subsequently the Stanley Mar Marcus House, 1935. After three tries, they were built in our house, albeit with sliding vents instead of drop-down vents. George Clark was a former employee of the V.C. Morris Gift Shop. He requested that Wright design him a simpler bachelor cabin on Carmel Beach. It was right next door to the Welsh cottage that Della tried to buy. Sunbonnet was the name that Wright gave to the cottage. The steep roof line soaring up from the ground and facing into the sea is like an abstract parasol and protects the house from gusty winds shading the glass at high noon and yet giving an unimpeded view along the beach out to the sea. At last, it was never built here. The house was later modified and built for Georgine Boomer on the property near the Arizona Biltmore Hotel. So now let's turn to the house that was actually built. The Cabin on the Rocks was the name given to the house by Wright. Here is one of the first perspective drawings of the house. This one drawing was done by Ling Po, I'm told, when he was at Taliesin. Here are a few perspective drawings. They clearly show Wright playing with various configurations for the house on the lot. This shows the house fairly close to its eventual location. The drawing also shows the house laid out on a 4x4 four four parallelogram grid. This resulted in 60 and 120 degree angles throughout the house and a heavy emphasis on triangular forms. As was very common during that busy period, Wright's designs and drawing were flow, slow in coming. This made Della frantic, and she sought the advice of friends. In the correspondence, there are quite a few humorous letters. Let me share two of them with you. The first one comes after four letters from Della to Wright and is dated May 17, 1949. My dear Mrs. Walker, I have given careful consideration to the rechanging of the cabin plan and conclude that it would be a mistake. All things considered, there are advantages either way but the present use of the plot has more and is on the whole better way to live than the exposed situation. The coves become part of the house and the loggia is protected from the sea storm. It is also cupped against other winds. I'm afraid that you are being confused by too much advice. Sincerely yours, Frank Lloyd Wright. As we saw in the perspective drawings, what Wright said was accurate. He did a number of lo different locations of the house. The second one comes after nine more letters from Wright and is dated August 17, 1949. Dear Mrs. Walker, we hesitate to proceed because of your continued indecision. Frankly, you have me puzzled. There is so much work needed to be done for so many clients eagerly awaiting to build that I don't like to go ahead until you decide to listen to me rather than your friends. I still like the revised house featuring the cove and assure you that no house you have seen could resemble what the cabin on the rocks represents. Sincerely yours, Frank Lloyd Wright. This is an as-built drawing of the original house, not done by Wright. In fact, most of our drawings differ from the actual house in significant ways. One of the reasons why was Mark Mills. He was Italian as an apprentice for Wright for four years before getting kicked out along with Paolo Solari. He and Paolo went on to build the first dome house for a client that would become Mrs. Solari. Mark is seen reclining in the partially constructed house on the right. Long story short, Mark ends up in Carmel working for Miles Bain, the contractor of the, for the Walker house. Miles hires him because he could read and interpret Wright's drawing. Wright was very unhappy, but Della liked him and he stayed. After construction, a grateful Della offered Mark two options. She would pay to send him around the world studying architecture, or she would give him two lots on which to build. Mark chose the latter. The lots are located on the eastern corner of 13th Avenue and Mission Street in Carmel. He built one house for his parents and one for Speck. This is a picture of the Speck house remodeled from the original. Mark turned out to be quite an accomplished architect in his own right, designing many iconic houses along the California Central Coast. His archives are housed at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. My grandmother, Harriet, and Mark remained friends their entire lives. He would sit with her when she opened the house 
once per year for the Carmel Heritage Society's home tour. They both enjoy talking with visitors and telling stories. Eventually, construction started. Walter Oles was the initial local apprentice, but he gave way to Aaron Green when Aaron moved up to San Francisco. Miles Bain was the contractor. The first action was to lower the surface of the lot by four feet. The purpose was to give the house a low profile, the point on the point, and provide privacy from the road. Wright wanted the house to be built with ledge-type masonry of many of his other Usonian houses. In this sort of wall, the stones are laid flat and the wall is made uneven with ledges and projections. Gala insisted on using local Carmel stone, a somewhat soft and porous sedimentary rock with wonderful color variation. However, it is blocky and right objective. Nevertheless, Della insisted and it came out beautifully. As you can see in this picture, it even has the ledges and protrusions that Wright wanted. Despite concerns with its durability, it has held up very well outside of the ship's prow. Here is my dad, Della's grandson, on the in-process ship's prow. The rebar is all in pit place and the wall is starting to rise from the rocks below. Note the steel in the living room, upper left, critical to the structural design that allows for the windows and the dramatic 270 degree view of the ocean. On the left is Della on the beach with a contractor shack behind. On the right is Aaron Green with Alma, Della's youngest and named after Della's sister. Along the way, there were a few glitches. The mason laid the stone for the fireplace in the same horizontal pattern as the rest of the house. This was incorrect and he had to relay the stone in the arranged, angled arrangement Wright called for. The fireplace is built for pole logs laid on end. When a fire is lit, the result is quite dramatic. And yes, when the logs collapse, embers are spilled out onto the floor. Good thing the floor is cement. And it warms the room up quite nicely. There continued to be a spirited exchange between Della and Wright, and Aaron Green did his best to mediate. One of the more humorous episodes had to do with the kitchen door. This is the original layout for the workspace, or kitchen. Note the double sink on the top right facing a window. To the left of the sink is a dishwasher. Della wanted a door in the kitchen to bring in groceries and remove trash. Wright said they should go through the front door. On February 27, 1951, he writes, My dear Mrs. Walker, again we are up in the air. It looks very much as though the cabin on the rocks was on the rocks in more senses than one. You were once of my mind about the cabin. You gave me reason to think so, and I was happy to build it and put my best mind and heart into producing a little masterpiece appropriate to the unique site. An ordinary little door and window on that site would look as foolish as a hen resting where you ought to find a seagull. I am unwilling to spoil my charming seabird and substitute the hen. You don't need me for that. Anyone can do it. Sincerely yours, Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, Mark Mills was there, and now so is the door. No one yet has complained that we don't have a dishwasher. Wright was terrified that his gem would be spoiled with a trash can for all to see from the beach. But there was a solution. The trash can was sunk into the ground. The trash folks still pick it up out of the ground to this day. Some other features of the house were concrete floors with integral color, Cherokee red. Note the grid pattern delineated in the floor. There is radiant heating in the floor. It works and it works to this day. The wood in the house is mostly red cedar. The ceiling is combed plywood, a common material in mid-century modern houses at the time. Note how all the lines of the comb converge to the, po to the point of the fireplace. And of course, no Frank Lloyd Wright home would be complete without the built-in furniture he designed. For us, it includes bedroom storage and the couch under the windows. And oh yes, there are those stepped out windows. Almost done. The roof was quite a problem as it was designed to be made of copper. However, during the Korean War, copper was on restriction. You could not get it. So, Aaron Green worked with Wright to design an enamel-coated steel roof instead. It consisted of four-foot four equilateral triangle pieces connected together in quite an intricate way. 
There was a fascia band as well. All had a press pattern at the edge. Here is a drawing of the triangular panel and the facial panel, fascia panel. Aaron worked with his mother-in-law, Jeanette Hawson Harbour, to create color samples of the porcelain enamel. Jeanette was a very talented ceramist, and it was she who created and manufactured the Frank Lloyd Wright red tiles that are on some Wright houses. Aaron had the roof manufacturer make up 10 different color samples. He brought them to Wright and asked him to choose a color. Wright looked at the samples for some time and said, I don't want to select one. I don't want it to look like linoleum. Use them all. Aaron had to create a very complicated roof pattern with the idea that the variations all would be randomly sprinkled across all roof surfaces. Aaron des designated the color panel which would be installed in each location on the roof. He said that this was the most demanding and challenging responsibility he ever undertook on Wright's behalf throughout his long professional affiliation with him. And remember, Aaron was the one who got the Marin County Civic Center built. But it was worth it. This is a screenshot from the movie A Summer Place, 1959. As Aaron himself said, it's an absolutely gorgeous roof. The company guaranteed the roof would not rust because the enamel was baked on both sides of the steel. Well, it did rust. And for a number of years, the company would come out and repair or replace a tile here or there. That did not work for Della, so when the copper came off restriction, she removed the enamel roof and replaced it with copper. Aaron was quite disappointed. Of course, saying that the copper roof was, quote, not nearly as handsome as that enamel roof. For the longest time, one of my greatest disappointments was that Della did not keep one or two of those roof panels. In October of this year, 2021, I finally found a sample panel. It is a fascia panel, and you can see the detail on the edges. A little background. In 1951, Wright worked with Aaron Green to design an office on Grant Avenue in San Francisco. In 1988, Aaron had to move that and the office was sold to a collector in Michigan. It has taken a bit of a journey since then. It was recently installed at the Hagen History Center in Erie, Pennsylvania. Jan Novi, an associate of Green's and curator of his archives, found and lent this sample fascia panel to this history center. I happen to be part of the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy's conference held this year in Buffalo, New York. Conservancy visited the office installation and I was able to see and touch the sample panel. And Jan had it placed in the same location it existed when it was in Aaron's original office. And you can see it here on the lower right. Another controversy erupted over the landscape. This is an Ezra Stoller photo of the original garden designed by Tommy Church. Tommy Church was a nationally recognized as one of the pioneers of modernism in garden landscape design. Of course, Tommy's qualifications did not hold water with Mr. Wright. On March 21st, 1952, he writes to Della, distressing news on several quarters. One of my former apprentices, no, not Mark Mills, says to Aaron Green, someone has ruined Mr. Wright's house with landscaping. Walter Olds, distressed, says, Mrs. Walker hired a professional landscaper to undo all that Mr. Wright has done for her. If you did employ one, it is the first time it has happened to me in a long lifetime of building. The first destructive insult, and I don't believe it. Throughout the nation, these professional vermin plant a skirt of shrubbery around the house and stick up a couple of trees at the entrance. A William worse than Worcester shack might be benefited from this stock performance. Not so the cabin on the rocks. Is it all true? I love the cabin and have had it in my heart as well as my head. The only intransigence on your part, so far you've seemed the ideal client, was a rupture with the outside kitchen door. I hope you will like the delicate and not too expensive roof. Aaron made an et has an estimate made here, but will get another down there. In the meantime, I wave to you au revoir. Very faithfully, Frank Lloyd Wright. He was headed to Paris. Now. Della responds on March 27th. What a scolding, and I don't deserve it. Someone is trying to make trouble. Nothing has been done to harm our house. I had to get a contract for the driveway and grading, and the bids were fantastic. I asked Tommy Church, whom I have known since he was a child, to help me, and he got a reasonable bid without charge. 
I planted myself about 2,000 succulents or ice plants. We brought rocks from the beach and put one of the man-eating clamshells on. We placed the other where you said it should go. I went into the woods and got small pine trees, which all died. I did not want grass to care for, and Tommy suggested mini gravel, like the terrace, and I have put that in and like it. But if you do not, out it comes. No real change has been made, and there is no reason for anyone's quoting Tommy of having said that you would not like it. His one idea has been to follow the sketches and planting that you made. My experience in you, with you and in building the cabin has been one of the most delightful ones of my life, and I hope nothing will happen to mar it. You are supreme to me. Affectionately, Della Walker. The garden stayed and has grown up considerably over time. And by the way, this photo shows the edge detail on the roof really well. Finally, it was time to move in. The roof was not yet on, but the house was ready. Della settled into her life at the house. And here are two photos of the living room in her time. She was the only family member ever to call the house her permanent residence. In 1958, Della married Jim Van Lovenselz. She was 81 and he was 77. She was no longer a woman living alone. Here they are sitting with Undine, who we will meet soon. You can see that Jim was quite a bit larger than Della, and he was not about to live in the bedroom right designed for her. See the Ezra Stola photo on the left. So, what to do? Now, Della was an artist. She had requested that Wright design her an artist studio, which he did in 1956. Well, in 1960, my uncle John Sandy Walker, a young architect at the time, supervised the construction, but as a bedroom, not as an artist studio. This is a Scott Zimmerman photo of the back bedroom addition. As Mark Mills and many of the original craftsmen were around, the addition has a very similar look to the rest of the house. At the same time, Della installed a windscreen outside the bedroom. She had asked Wright about it, and he, but he was not enthusiastic. But, as before, Della got her way. Undine is the name for the iconic mermaid statue done by sculptor Robert Howard. She arrived on the ship's prow in 1964. Della and Jim threw a big party for her, with quite a gathering. and newspaper coverage. Living on the ocean, the salt spray constantly gathers on the window panes and clouds the windows. Here Della is rinsing them off, something she had to do often. You gotta love that she's doing this in her pearls. At Wright's suggestion, Della placed glass balls in the urn by the front gate. That is my grandmother Harriet on the right. These balls were used to float fishing nets in Japan. They would break free and float across the Pacific and wash up on western shores. The balls were soon removed as they would break and people would take them, and so forth. I also included this photo with my grandmother as I can't say enough about how much she meant to this house and vice versa. She was an excellent steward for life and spent a great deal of time down here. I have been involved with the house since childhood as well. That is me with Della on the left and with my son Colin at the house on the right. Colin is now 37. Here I am with two of my siblings and Della. I'm in the middle looking up. I must have been around five or six. Notice the man-eating clamshell referred to in the landscape kerfuffle. We know that Frank Lloyd Wright did visit the house in December 1952. The letter he wrote was like a report card on the house and Della's use of it. This is the only photo we have of him on the site. It was published in the fall 1999 Frank Lloyd Wright Quarterly. The date in the caption places it prior to construction, so I'm not sure it's correct. Wright visited the house another time when Aaron Green brought him to Carmel to speak at the local chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Della was there as well. Wright and Aaron stayed in the Sandpiper Inn, only a block away from the house. They had to come by the house. Della was not much of one for pictures, so there are no photos of Wright actually in the house, to my great disappointment. But maybe, like the roof panels, one will show up someday. 
Besides appearing in a summer place, the house has been featured in numerous magazines, such as House Beautiful, and books, such as Alan Weintraub's. And we have hosted a number of commercial photo shoots at the house. On January 6, 1956, Della writes to Wright to let him know that, quote, the San Francisco office has sent me a small red tile, which I shall proudly have installed in the wall of the house. I am very grateful for you for the tile. And that is how the house got its tile. Finally, in 2016, we were able to get the house listed on the National Register of Historic Places. I hope you have found this presentation informative. This house has meant the world to my family throughout the years, and I'm very happy to share it with you.